Hi, folks. Welcome. Hello, hello. Good hello. morning. How are you? Good morning. We're going to get started in just a moment, but we like to get started with a little bit of an intro for everybody. So um, we would love for you to add your voice to the public chat here, to the chat. Um, go ahead and put your name, uh, what art forms, form or forms you work in. Um, love for you to, to put in your location and, and you're welcome to include an acknowledgement of the native land that you are currently on. Uh, Jade's going ahead and, and doing a sample of this. And then something beautiful you could see out your window or if there's not a window in your space, something beautiful in your space. Um, you know, creative aging programs, we're gonna be talking about the next three days are all about working in community. So we, we here at Lifetime recognize that when we're working from home or when we're in person, we you know, are on land that has been stewarded by indigenous communities for many generations. So in honor of the communities where you are calling in from and where you live, you can uh, utilize a map um, that we are gonna put into the chat in a second. Nathan, if you wouldn't mind putting that into the chat. Um, you can utilize this map um, to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land that you're calling in from belongs. Thanks, Nathan. So I'm Julie, I'm the Education Associate here at Lifetime Arts. I'm calling in from West Orange, New Jersey. Um, the original habit inhabitants of this land are the Lenape people. They're part of the Algonquin Nation. Um, they spoke in the Muncie dialect. And I actually just was doing some of my own research and um, I found out that the Lenape clan specifically that inhabited this immediate area were the Hackensack clan um, of the Lenape people. And at Northfield Avenue, which is a really big street just to the north of me, this direction uh, was an original Hackensack trail and has continued on as Northfield Avenue. That's a bit I wanted to acknowledge today. Great, folks are putting stuff into the chat. Um, Deborah Soule, painting, drawing from Rock Springs. She sees grass, though not yet green. <laughs> We're in that stage of sort of brownish to green grass. Hi, Sherry. Paper making, mixed media, print making, beautiful, clear sidewalks. Thanks. Dane here is my co trainer. And looking out on Minnesota snow melting. And Dane, would you mind um, pronouncing the land for me that you're calling in from? It's it's Anishinaabe. It is a, a, a branch of the uh, Midewakantan Lakota Sioux Nation. Thank you. Debbie and Collins, I'm I'm actually across the street from a famous old footpath as well that went for hundreds of miles. It's it's. Um, there's some signage about it and they're, they're restoring it as a um, educational interpretive tour, which is really cool. Right across the street. Wonderful, wonderful. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Greg. Lynn put in her intro, calling in from Casper. Hi, Susan, music educator from Jackson Hole. We got Barry, picture frame maker, wood turner. Started art career with photography. Beautiful, from Kirby. Hey, Carol talking about some birds on the trees and branches outside her window. Birds that never went south, that's great. Hi, Maria. Near, near Maria is the Medicine Lodge State Archaeological Site. Wow, where there's a record of continuous human habitation for over 12, 12 K years, 12,000 years. Thank you. Shauna calling in from Lander. Wonderful, and Paul, hi, Paul. Here's Josh from Wyoming Arts Council and Paul and Deborah are neighbors. Hi neighbors. Great. And Maria is looking out of muddy hay fields. Okay, keep those intros coming. These are wonderful to read. I hope you all get a chance to look at them and read. We're gonna have more chance to talk in um, some breakout groups, but we just love to see these um, intros from everyone. Hi, Chris. Calling in, looking out on Ocean Lake and Owl Creek Mountains. Wonderful. Um, we'll welcome you all. We're just really glad to be here together in our sort of virtual space. Um, I wanted to first uh, start off just going over some Zoom protocols for our training. We're gonna be together for the next three days and we just have some ways in which we'd love 
for you to, to best engage with us, just some uh, housekeeping items. Um, so we are asking for your full active participation and engagement during this session, just as if we were together in person, which hopefully someday we will be soon. Um, to fully participate in the session, there's just a few things we'd like you to know. Um, Lifetime Arts is gonna be sharing our screen like right now. And for the best, the best view um, during the session, we really recommend that you view the screen in side by side viewing mode. So the way to do that is if you go up to the top, um, there's a green button that says you are viewing Nathan's screen. Um, so you're gonna click, click the drop down arrow there under view options. And there's an option that's called side by side mode. So when you're in side by side mode, what's great about this is that a little bar should show up between the slide itself and then everybody's video. And you can adjust that to see more of everybody's faces or to see more of the video. So again, that's side by side mode in the view options button. You can also of course always change the view of who, who you see in this mode by selecting either gallery view or speaker view top right of your screen. Uh, we will have a lot of group discussions in which case I would suggest that you click gallery view. Um, but if you, when we're just presenting you could be in speaker view but we will be spotlighting folks so that won't be an issue too much. We're gonna ask that you keep yourselves muted unless you're otherwise um, directed to just to eliminate background noise. Um, we also really would love you to, to keep your camera on. I see a lot of people's faces, which is just really important, you know, as we're trying to share community here together. Understood if it's not, that's not possible for you, but if it is at all, we'd really love to see your face regardless of whether you're still in your bathrobe. We, we welcome bathrobes, that's all good. Um, to adjust either of these settings, of course, you can click on the microphone or camera off icons at the bottom left of your screen and a slash through one of the icons means that you know, you're muted or your camera is off. So we'd love for you to stay muted for now, but turn your cameras on. Also, we would love for you to, to take the time right now to rename yourself on Zoom so that people know your full name and you could add preferred pronouns if you wish, you could add your art forms, but definitely we would you know, love to have your name. So you can do that by clicking on the participants tab, um, which should be towards the bottom of your screen. When you, your name should be at the very top, you would click the more button. There's gonna be then a drop down menu and you'll have the option to rename. So you can see you know, Annie, David, Jade, myself, and Dane, we, and Nathan, we've renamed ourselves, we have our name or preferred pronoun, in our case, on our organization. So if there's an organization you're representing, please add that as well. Just another way that we can keep getting to know each other. So go ahead and take a moment to do that right now. That would be great. So during the session, questions, comments come up. We welcome them. So please go ahead and put them in the chat function as they come up to everyone. You make it a public chat. Um, you'll find the chat icon is at the bottom of your screen in the very middle of the toolbar. A staff member will definitely see your chat. We record those questions and comments. And then later when we have an open Q&A, we will address them. Um, we're very good at doing that. So please, whenever you have a question, something comes up, just get it in the chat and we will um, address it later. Please note that throughout the three days of training, we're also using breakout groups a lot. So we just ask that everybody be ready to fully participate in those breakout groups too. Finally, the last important part, um, oh, also, sorry, if you want to then save the chat from the session at the end of the session, you know, if people are sharing some good resources and um, you can do so by opening the chat box and you'll click on the three dots on the bottom right and you can select save chat. You'll see that there in that image and then the entire chat will be saved to your computer. So something you might want to do at the end of the session to save anything that's come up in the chat. And finally, we just want to take a moment to go over Lifetime Arts Portal, which you all have access to. So you should have received an email with information about the portal from Deputy Director, um, who is here present with us today, Nathan Majoros, with information to register for the portal, which is also how you should have found today's Zoom link. So hopefully you all have access to the portal but we did wanna take you all through it again. Um, when you log into the portal, if you haven't already, hopefully you already have, you'll see that you have access to a sort of training space for this cohort. And we are calling you all Cohort Wyoming Teaching Artists Cohort A, Cohort A. So in this space, you're gonna see um, a description of the training overall. 
you'll see all the bios for all the trainers that you're working with today. And then there are these pre-training assignments for each day. So those are linked to directly, if you can see this image, day one, day two, day three, you click on one of those and you'll see all of these sort of resources and assignments for that day of training. There's the Zoom links for each session are there. You'll see at the end, a link to an evaluation for the whole training where you'll give us feedback on the training. There will also be some post-training resources that you'll have access to like um, recordings of each of these sessions. Those will be posted to the portal um, after each day. So it's really important that you access this portal and view the resources that are there. There's videos, there's important templates, um, there's great links. They really complete the training. Um, there's research um, and there's also some specific homework assignments that then we're gonna follow up with during the synchronous sessions. So really important that you, you um, access those resources. If you have any questions about the portal, you're having any issues with it, can't find it, can't find the links, please you can direct chat Nathan Majoros here from Lifetime or David also, David Weir is here um, from Lifetime, either of those folks, or you can just drop an email to support at lifetimearts.org. Um, but really, you can even just pop your name right now in the chat if you've got some, have some issues with the portal, really wanna make sure you can access that. I just wanted to welcome some other folks out and come in. Um, Gail has been coming and welcome Gail, Lucinda. Hi, Wendy from Lander. We've got Hillary, music therapist. Hi, Robert, welcome. Uh, and Michael, uh, executive director of Wyoming Arts Council, wonderful. Also a bass player, good to know. Um, and Annie went ahead and put that email in the chat if you have any issues with the portal. Okay, great. Um, again, just want to say I'm Julie Klein, Education Associate. I will be in your trainers today along here with Dane Stauffer, a Lifetime Arts trainer calling in from uh, Minnesota. And I'll, I just wanted to pass it. Also, we have folks here um, welcoming us from the Wyoming Arts Council. We have Creative Arts Specialist Taylor Craig and folklorist and health and wellness specialist, Joshua Chrysler. They're gonna talk a little bit more about the Creative Aging in Wyoming Libraries project. Welcome Taylor and Josh. Yeah, thank you. Good to see everybody. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, my name is Josh Chrysler. I'm on staff with the Wyoming Arts Council. Um, as Julie said, I run our folk and traditional arts program and I also run our health and wellness in the arts program. And I was just gonna talk about that for a couple minutes. Um, several years ago, the Wyoming Arts Council became interested in programs um, that have to do with arts and health. And some of you may remember um, at that time, the Arts Council sent out a survey where we wanted to get a sense from artists and arts organizations and care providers across the state um, sort of to get an idea of what kind of arts and health programming that um, folks in the state were interested in. And we learned that um, arts and aging, creative aging was really sort of a, a key area that um, the state was interested in exploring. And uh, so we started doing some research, trying to figure out what we could offer to, uh, to the state in, in that area. And um, that's when we learned that the uh, Wyoming State Library was also very interested in creative aging and that they had already been um, in discussions with Lifetime Arts about uh, bringing some creative aging programs to Wyoming. And uh, so we were, we were really happy to uh, be able to partner with the State Library System and with Lifetime Arts. And that sort of brings us uh, to the training here today. Um, and we're also at the Arts Council, we're, we're committed to um, finding ways to uh, turn this into sustainable ongoing programming. We're not viewing this as a sort of one and done um, programming. We're hoping to find ways to carry this on um, forward into the future after the training. And uh, Taylor Craig is gonna talk a little bit more about our plans um, for this moving into the future. So turn this over to Taylor. Hi everyone. Um, good morning. It's so nice to see everyone finally in, in person, basically. Um, uh, yeah, so I am the creative arts specialist at the Wyoming Arts Council, and that means um, that a lot of what I do is work with individual artists and um, specifically on professional development things. So that's kind of how Josh and I merged together with this 
professional development opportunity for teaching artists and his expertise in the in the wellness and the health space. So um, just so you know how our partnership kind of makes sense. <laughs> um, so as Josh mentioned, this is a, a, a longer term project that we're working on. And this is really step one, which is really why today is so exciting. Um, so I kind of just outlined it a little here and wanted to walk you guys through because I know it, it is a little confusing how it's all working with libraries and um, the aging population throughout our state. So, you know, the first step is, is happening right now. We're training both uh, teaching artists, you all, and um, last week some librarians were trained on how to host um, creative aging programs in their facilities. And then phase two that comes after that training um, starting this summer is that the libraries are eligible to apply for some seed granting to do um, to actually put on creative aging programs in their libraries. And we're going to do a lot of work to connect you all to those libraries um, to hopefully um, create so that you can create programs with them and 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 be hired to do that work. Um, Phase three of this, Josh and I are actually just learned and, and the um, announcement was just put out publicly last week that we received a, um, a pretty large grant from the National Association of State Arts Agencies um, to, to continue our creative aging work. And phase three of that will be that um, later this summer, early fall, we're gonna host another training with um, arts nonprofit administrators. So it'll be similar to what the librarians went, um, but arts nonprofits that are also interested in doing this work so that we can expand our work, you know, a little bit beyond libraries and as well. And then those um, organizations um, in phase four will be eligible to apply for seed granting from us. That again, we are hoping to connect you all to those organizations and build those relationships so that you're hopefully hired for those those positions to, to do that work. And then phase five is um, what Josh was talking about is that, you know, we at the Arts Council are committed to then continuing past just these seed grants of how we can make a longer term commitment of granting to, um, to this type of work so that there's continued opportunities for you all to do this work. So yeah, just to reiterate sort of what our investment is and how we see this all playing out over the next, you know, we're looking at only 2022 right now, but beyond and, um, and you know, much farther than that. So Josh and I are always your, your people at the Arts Council if you have questions or if you, um, you know, want a connection to anywhere. And um, I know we'll, we'll talk a lot at the very, at the end of the last day about, you know, our plans for connecting you all to libraries and and these other programs we have going on. Um, but I just, we wanted to take some time to let you know how this all fits into the bigger picture. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Justin Taylor. And just for a lifetime, we're really thrilled about this partnership and the possibilities for Wyoming and creative aging. Thank you both so much. Um, and glad that we can welcome you back at the end of day three to answer any further questions about the initiative. And we'll be talking more about the initiative um, at the end of the session today as well. Great, so over the next three days, we're gonna cover a lot of ground with all you folks. Um, our goals for you are we're first really just gonna introduce you to the creative aging field. Um, then we're gonna spend a lot of time with you um, analyzing ageism and its impact on program design and delivery and where ageism really shows up for you in your life. Um, we want to, for you to walk away understanding the creative aging programming models. Uh, we're going to go over both the in-person model and then ways you could adapt if you wanted to work remotely. We're going to talk about older adult learning principles um, and really about how you can structure lessons that really meet the needs and engage the creative spirit of older adults. We're going to learn about exemplary programs from across the country as real models of successful creative aging programming. We're also gonna offer you the opportunity to really visualize your own creative aging program um, that you might teach that respond to the needs, the interests, and also the cultural background of the older adults that you might work with. And finally, we're gonna talk a lot about best practices in curriculum design, specifically for the 55 and better communities and also for multi-generational community partnerships. Thank you. 
Julie, hello everybody. I am Dane Stauffer. I am uh, Julie's uh, partner in this today, along with everyone else. Um, just again, to sum up um, what we're doing today, we're going to take some time to explore ageism. We're gonna take a break to just let it all settle in. We'll come back and we'll talk about creative arts um, education models, specifically how to create sequential learning that culminates in a, in a presentation. Uh, we'll take another break, take some notes, and then we'll talk more specifically about SAFE planning. SAFE is an acronym um, for, for some of the, the criteria that we look for in the curriculum, and it's something that probably most of you are already doing. I found for me it was really, I, I was just nice to have names for things and just continue to bring more intentionality to it. Uh, then we'll discuss specifically creative aging in the Wyoming Libraries initiative. And then we'll have some time for Q&A and wrap up. And I just want to say, Julie, you know, I'm really honored to be here. And I've been doing this for a few years. I've been teaching for decades. And I am, I'm finding that this is not only an invitation to adapt my curriculum to a different uh, cohort of people, it is a booming field that is, uh, is, is, revolutionary i think you know here come the boomers and we're not going to play bingo so thanks dane exactly we're going to talk a lot more about that thanks dane i wanted to also introduce a couple of other lifetime arts folks that are um, here on the call we have annie montgomery our director of education um, david weir is our pro program coordinator is going to serve as a facilitator in breakout rooms today jade lamb is a lifetime arts uh, trainer also going to serve as facilitator and of course Nathan Majora, deputy director, who is our all around support um, and slide master, honestly, as well today. So thank you, Nathan. So we're going to start with an experiential, experiential exploration of ageism to really generate dialogue and awareness about the potential impact of ageism on program design. So I wanted to, for you, everybody, just to take a moment to check in with yourselves. So right here, right now, sit yourself down in your body, whether you're sitting or standing as them. Take a moment to check in. What age do you feel like you are in this moment on the inside? What is your internal age? So it's really more of a feeling than a thought. What is your internal age today right now? I'm going to ask that uh, you write that down. Take a pen, pencil, a big marker if you've got it, on a piece of paper or maybe in a notebook you're writing notes in. I want you to write that number down. Just this number right here today, this moment. What age do you feel like on the inside? And I'm gonna ask that you uh, hold it up to the camera. Yeah, great, cool. Okay, I'm gonna make everybody big so I can see. See Jade's, Jade's is 30. David, 33. I see Sherry, 33. I feel like we should match partners that have the same, their same age today. Um, 37, Dane. Great. Oh, Gail, I can't quite see your number. You can also put it in the chat too. 45, Deborah. Great. Barry, I can't quite see your number. 85, 25, 25. Okay, thanks, Barry. Lucinda got 30. Great. Oh, thanks, Carol. 65. Okay, great. Jen, 25. Wendy, 50. Okay, keep them keep holding up for one more second. Annie, 70 today. Great. Paul, Paul, 20. Great. Okay, lovely. Um, Maria, 40 question mark. Maria, can I ask you to unmute yourself and talk about why that was your number and also why the question mark? Sure. Um, yeah, I sat here really trying to figure that out for quite a long time. Um, and just pretty much arbitrarily chose 40. I don't think I've ever uh, felt one age or another in inside. I, I certainly feel one age or another in my body, I'm in physically. Um, but yeah, that was a hard question for me. <laughs> so there, that's, there's, therein lies the question mark. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, so interesting. So you brought up that physical, that they, first of all, you maybe answer the, the question in a physical way, like how does my physical body feel? 
Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, well, what, and then why did, why did you say 40 then with not knowing what's his answer? And then you said 40 question mark? What, what does 40 mean to you? <laughs> well, I thought, I don't feel brand new. I don't feel like I'm about to check out. I have some wisdom and experience, probably more experience than wisdom, I hate to say. Um, so that kind of, you know, uh, yeah, I, I kind of chose that as a middle ground. I hear you. Okay, great. So 40 meaning middle. I like that you said that I'm not brand new, but I'm not checking out yet. So 40 to you meant that sort of middle middle place. Thank you. Somebody mm -hmm. else want to share about your number? If you just want to raise your hand or, or uh, say, say your name in the chat. Somebody else want to share? If you don't volunteer, I'm going to pick on you. How about Barry? Barry, remind me your, your number again. I couldn't see it at first and then I could. What was it? 20? 25, because I still feel, and I actually sometimes feel even half that age, like some kind of irresponsible kid. An irresponsible kid. That's what 25 yeah, right. means too. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a professional artist, so I'm dedicated to, to the practice of art and less about the practice of uh, business and life outside of the arts. Great, great. So but, 25 to you means, well, go ahead, Barry. Well, 20 might have a little sense. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little sense, but not engaging in the business business of life yet. That's what 25 right, right. is. Still have, I still have high ambition. 25, you know, a young artist like that, uh, they have pretty high ambition. Even though yeah. at 25, I was probably thinking I got New York on my mind. And then at uh, 28, I lived in Kirby, Wyoming, population 92, where I've been for 26 years. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Great. So also you're saying 25 to you kind of meant a particular moment in your life, a sort of moment of. of... Oh, it was huge development. You bet. Yeah. Big development. Yeah. I'm still development stage. So that's a good thing right. to point out. Yeah. I'm still in that. Uh, can't study enough. Can't learn enough. Can't do enough. Can't enjoy life enough, really. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, Laura put her number in the chat and her name. I didn't know if Laura, if you wanted to say anything about your, your number 30, why that was your number. You wanna unmute yourself. Oh, Laura, you're muted. Do you think you can unmute? It would just, uh, no. Okay, you can, and no worries at all. You can put your, um, you could also put more of your thoughts there into the chat. I see that Dane says, oh, hi, okay. Laura. I, I'm having a lot of technical difficulties this morning. I'm not using my own computer. <laughs> so I, I get anyway, um, I put 30 because uh, for myself, uh, 30 represents my age of, of cur real curiosity. And, the, you know, after being through undergraduate and graduate school and a lot of those kinds of programs where you're directed in your curiosity, uh, 30s was my first time to be directing my own curiosity and cool. and helping others you know i've always been a teacher okay cool i love that thank you so much the idea of a moment where you finally get to direct your own curiosity and i, I what makes me wonder if older adults uh some may be coming to retirement age or coming to what we kind of are calling a third age even of their life might also be at that point of directing their own curiosity great so all this to say this is a really big question right your internal age what does this mean um, and that in the end, you heard people had such different reasons for their answer. And the numbers meant different things for different people, right? 25 to Barry was like this sort of moment of new development that feels like where he's at now. For some people, 25 was, you know, maybe a really sad moment. They would never want to go back to that age, right? For some people, 40 means, you know, the middle of life. For other people, 40 might have a different. And that the numbers really don't mean anything. You know, there's nothing objective. We all bring our own subjective experiences or subjective, not even subjective. We also bring what society tells us about these ages and what these ages mean. And I think especially when we're younger and we haven't been the ages yet, society is, has a lot of power to tell us what, is, what, is, what do these ages mean? What does 80 mean? You know, that's very much, we're being told what that means until we get a chance to actually experience it. I think the experience might be very different from what we think. 
Um, and that also we can be any age, we, we, we might different age in the morning than we are in the afternoon, right? We might feel like a totally different age just through the day or after a two hour Zoom call. You know, we'll see how, what age we feel after this call. Hopefully even better and better at whatever age we feel. Um, great, so I'm gonna pass it to Dane to, to, to continue in our thinking here. Thank you, Julie. Yes, it's really interesting because it raises so many questions. You know, what, what do we determine feeling a certain age is? If I feel older, does that mean I feel less than? That's why we're looking at this ageism and really examining and spending time with it because it's potent programming. Um, we're gonna play a little with another round of this. Now you can write this into the chat so I can read it or if you prefer the the old analog method, you could do that too, right into the chat or on your pad, please. Any, uh, anything that you have heard or said about yourself that relates to aging? Like I, I get this a lot, I take it as a compliment, but oh, you look so young for your age. Or I'll tell people how old I am and they say, wow, congratulations. <laughs> and I don't know necessarily what they mean other than, wow, you're still alive. But right into the chat, any ageist things that you've heard or said about yourself? Age before beauty. Oh, old people are so cute. Yes, I have a neighbor who's on the war path. Like, don't call me cute and don't call me seven years young or young lady. I've earned every... Yeah, when I was young, that's another one. Purpose. Oh, yes, senior moment. I'm having a senior moment. Ha, ha, ha. Back in the day, that's another one. And, you know, and we're not saying these are right or wrong. We're just noticing what agreements have we made around age. With your experience, I think it's implied you should know better. <laughs> that's another one. Oh, you're in pretty good, yeah, you're, you're in pretty good shape for the shape you're in. <laughs> yeah, I don't heal from injury as quick as I used to. I've said that. My body feels one, my mind feels younger. Yes, I'm right there with you. When is retirement? If you're thinking of retirement, have you planned for retirement? You haven't planned for retirement, <sighs> etc. So yes, you just see, I mean, they're innocuous, but it is, it's constant. And there's certain agreements that we have about aging that we are finding out aren't true. From the dictionary, uh, what Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the definition of ageism, prejudice, or discrimination against a particular age group, and especially the elderly. You know, that's an awakening for me. I thought it always had to do with the elderly. But of course, it can be any age group. You're too young. Interesting. I'm not a senior. I'm just an old timer. Yes, my name at the grocery store was suddenly dear. Uh, yes, right? So um, we're going to move into another section now. We're going to dig into this and, and um, hear a little bit of a talk from this really inspiring uh, uh, person who's confronting ageism, Ashton Applewhite. She wrote a book, This Chair Rocks. <laughs> a manifesto against ageism. And she's a spokesperson for a movement to mobilize against discrimination on the basis of age. In 2016, she joined the PBS site, nextavenue.org, which I highly recommend as a resource if you haven't checked that out. She was one of the top 50 influencers in aging and listed as influencer of the year for partly for this talk that we're gonna watch a little bit about, a little bit of. Um, and uh, <clears throat> should we just go into that share? Yep, Nathan's gonna play that for us right now. Excellent. We'll watch about four minutes. minutes. What's one thing that every person in this room is gonna become older? And most of us are scared stiff at the prospect. How does that word make you feel? I used to feel the same way. What was I most worried about? Ending up drooling in some grim institutional hallway. 
And then I learned that only 4% of older Americans are living in nursing homes, and the percentage is dropping. What else was I worried about? Dementia. Turns out that most of us can think just fine to the end. Dementia rates are dropping too. The real epidemic is anxiety over memory loss. <laughs> I also figured that old people were depressed because they were old, and they were going to die soon. <laughs> It turns out that the longer people live, the less they fear dying, and that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their lives. It's called the U curve of happiness, and it's been borne out by dozens of studies around the world. You don't have to be a Buddhist or a billionaire. The curve is a function of the way aging itself affects the brain. So I started feeling a lot better about getting older, and I started obsessing about why so few people know these things. The reason is ageism. Discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of age. We experience it any time someone assumes we're too old for something, instead of、uh, finding out who we are and what we're capable of, or too young. Ageism cuts both ways. All isms are socially constructed ideas: racism, sexism, homophobia, and that means we make them up, and they can change over time. All these prejudices pit us against each other to maintain the status quo. Like auto workers in the U.S. competing against auto workers in Mexico instead of organizing for better wages, we <laughs> we know it's not okay to allocate resources by race or by sex. Why should it be okay to weigh the needs of the young against the old? All prejudice relies on othering, seeing a group of people as other than ourselves, other race, other religion, other nationality. The strange thing about ageism, that other. Is us. Ageism feeds on denial, our reluctance to acknowledge that we are going to become that older person. It's denial when we try to pass for younger, or when we believe in anti-aging products, or when we feel like our bodies are betraying us simply because they are changing. Why on earth do we stop celebrating the ability to adapt and grow as we move through life? Why should aging well mean struggling to look and move like younger versions of ourselves? It's embarrassing to be called out as older until we quit being embarrassed about it, and it's not healthy to go through life dreading our futures. The sooner we get off this hamster wheel of age denial, the better off we are. Stereotypes are always a mistake, of course, but especially when it comes to age, because the longer we live, the more different from one another we become. Right? Think about it. And yet, we tend to think of everyone in a retirement home as the same age, old, <laughs> when they can span four decades. Can you imagine thinking that way about a group of people between the ages of 20 and 60? When you get to a party, be ahead for people your own age. Have you ever grumbled about entitled millennials? Have you ever rejected a haircut or a relationship or an outing because it's not age appropriate? For adults, there's no such thing. All these behaviors are ageist. We all do them, and we can't challenge bias unless we're aware of it. Nobody's born ageist, but it starts in early childhood. Around the same time, attitudes towards race and gender start to form, because negative messages about late life bombard us from the media and popular culture at every turn. Right? Wrinkles are ugly. Old people are pathetic. It's sad to be old. Wow,、um, thank you for sharing that. Now、um, we're going to break out into smaller groups, so we have a little time to discuss a、uh, few prompts. We have a few questions to、um, circle. We have about eighteen minutes to、uh, take some turns to discuss this. So、uh, let's break into、um, smaller groups. That'll be assigned.
All right, folks, welcome back. I don't know if you experienced like me, like I always do, it's never enough time. We're having a wonderful conversation and great intros um, in our group, but we are gonna have more chance to talk in the smaller groups. Um, but I did want our facilitators to share out, you know, just a couple of points from the conversation so we can all feel like we were all together in all of the groups and get a little, um, be a fly on the wall to, to listen in. So um, how about uh, David, would you mind sharing a couple points from your group? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, things that were surprising, uh, I think a lot of people were surprised by the uh, by the numbers in general, uh, be that sort of the percentage of people uh, who are who suffer from dementia over the course of, you know, and that it's not and that these numbers aren't higher. Uh, conversely, just sort of the growing uh, percent of the population that are older adults. Um, so that was I think that was surprising for a lot of people. Um, we also talked about uh, in terms of uh, experiencing ageism, a big thing that we talked about uh, was in uh, sort of in the professional world, uh, both as, you know, uh, in the job market in general, um, a, but also specifically uh, with uh, as an artist trying to get bookings and such. Uh, and how, um, you know, whether that just be, you know, being an older, by virtue of being an older adult, uh, or uh, through uh, appearing older, be that like having, you know, gray hair, uh, how very directly that impacted uh, getting work or getting booking gigs and things like that. Thank you, David. Really important issue. This ageism in the arts world, you know, where we all, we all are in in some capacity and it's definitely the present. Mm -hmm. Great, Dane, can I ask you to share from your group? Yes, um, a few, a lot of things came up, a few of them, um, just the, the surprise about that, you know, ageism applies to any age and some of us encountered the, uh, you're too young to tell me anything version of that, um, where it can start early and really just assumptions about age at any age creating trouble because then you're not dealing with the person in front of you, you're objectifying them already. Um, it was interesting and noted the curve of, you know, happiness and the anxiety about aging and really thinking about how much anxiety that can engulf um, and, and make you, you know, Know, limit your choices and, and you can I can internalize that and I can start to limit what I think is possible for me much less than anyone else um, and also encountering it in the medical field when you reach certain ages and bring up an ailment or something you know my feet are getting numb and how often the doctor will preface especially if they're younger than you um, they will preface it with well when you get to be your age which is the beginning of a dismissal or you know a beginning of let us know if it gets worse rather than or here's a drug rather than I'd like to explore therapies before drugs and so I think there's there's just a lot of assumptions uh, and also you know a lot of talk about really how arts can combat ageism and giving people a way to continue to learn and grow and engage with each other as an antidote to the assumptions that we make. Thank you Dane really important that the Yes, really, really, so many important issues you raised, but especially health issues around older adults really being dismissed and, and not considered. Um, great, Annie, would you share from your group? Yeah, um, a lot of this has been covered, so I'm going to just cover the a, a couple of things that that I thought were really interesting. Um, I mean, we had covered many. We we had a lot of the same sort of insights that have already been talked about from our other facilitators, but we really did dig in a little bit to like like what is it that will um, that these creative aging learning programs, what is it about them that might change this narrative around aging, around feeling invisible? And one of the things um, that we talked about was like the recruitment piece. Like once they learn what this is, it's a game changer. So like, how do we go about really demonstrating and talking and recruiting and showing people the, 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 um, opportunity these programs have to offer and how they can kind of be game changers for folks. And one of the things too that we thought about is like these classes need to be challenging. We need to, to, to really encourage people to take new risks, learn new things. You're never too old to learn and to really embrace that piece of it. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Jade, would you share from your group? 
Sure, we talked about some stereotyping of older people, for example, hearing. Um, not everyone has hearing problem when they're older. Maybe people should just speak louder <laughs> or more clear. Um, another thing, uh, when we learn art, we already feel younger. So this is one uh, main thing that we talked about. Um, you know, the, the, the process of learning, it engages your brain and um, it exercises your brain and that helps you to stay younger. Thank you, Jay, that's great. And my group, we had a, also a really fascinating conversation, lots of connections within the group. And one main thing that came up was really the cultural differences. Um, about ageism and the, the different ways that cultures, you know, uh, value the older folks in their community. And um, if I may say, Robert was talking about in his indigenous community and that, you know, elders are, uh, eat first at gatherings and there is just a real respect for tribal elders. Um, on the other hand, there's not as many off programs offered. So there is a respect, but then, you know, there's, there, there aren't these kinds of programs and how might these kinds of programs really supplement that, that cultural difference and um, that, that, that cultural support. Um, and I think it was, it was, shoot, I don't remember, also was brought up uh, important, uh, again, a cultural difference, of course, uh, between, um, uh, uh, well, as Ashton brings up, um, that uh, ageism in some cultures just doesn't exist the same way as it does, as, as we might say, in a European white culture. Um, and that the video was so shocking to, to those of us that come from the more Western or European culture. Um, Great, I think that was the, the, the main issues that came up. Thank you all so much for sharing. We're gonna keep sharing about this and I hope that you're gonna keep thinking about this, how ageism shows up in your own life. Sometimes it, it as Ashton says, it can really be the invisible-ism, um, yet we all are, you know, in our ways hold these ageist beliefs and they might affect the way that we plan programs for older adults. Um, wonderful, so I wanted just to move us to our break. We're gonna take a five minute stretch break the way that the five minute break, and then there is a stretch break opportunity. The way this is gonna work is Nathan's gonna play us some music. Um, and then in three minutes, the music is gonna fade out. And if you want, you can then partake in a stretch break that Dane is gonna lead for two minutes, and then we will start back. So we're gonna fully start back um, at 12.08. But if you wanna come in for that stretch break, 12.06 would be your time to engage in some stretching with everybody. Thanks so much, see you soon. Okay, if anyone would like to stretch, <laughs> I don't know if I can see. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a little quick uh, two minute stretch. You can see, this is one of my techniques. It's like Wizard of Oz, I'm the man behind the screen and I have that screen to block my infinitely more interesting background, but I just had to move it to have room. So. If you are standing, uh, and you could also do this sitting, whichever way you want, but if you are standing, just take a nice deep breath and extend up towards the ceiling and exhale. Inhale again and exhale and spiral to the left, spiral to the right. Gently spiral to the left and to the right. And sitting or standing, you're gonna take your palms, turn your thumbs so they're facing outward. And as you bring your thumbs backward, try to bring them past your shoulder line and open up your chest, lifting your heart. We're doing, this is the opposite move of sitting in front of the computer. <laughs> so inhaling, Lifting your heart and then exhaling like a bear hugging a big old tree. Just open up your back, inhaling the, like a bird, lifting your heart and exhaling to the front, shaking your shoulders out, stretching your right side up towards the ceiling, your left side up to the ceiling, your right side up to the side your left side up to the side and your right goes forward and your left goes forward will go up and up and to the side 
to the side and a forward and a forward and shake your right arm, shake your left arm, shake your right leg, uh, get the blood flowing, shake your left leg, leg, right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, shake your right arm and your left leg, left arm and your right leg, right arm and your left leg, and your whole body, <laughs> make some noise, tap your chest, wiggle your fingers, claws, open it out, shake your hands, and we're back. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, everyone. <laughs> Now, um, now that we're back, I'm assuming we are all back. We're going to um, take some of what we've discussed this morning. We're going to revisit our curriculum. We're going to dig into the creative arts, creative aging arts education model. Uh, now that you have a clearer understanding of what our goals are in working with older adults and building these programs. So, um, why is everyone talking about aging? Well, worldwide, the population is aging due to falling fertility rates. People are having fewer children. There is a rising longevity. Pe put simply, people are living longer and healthier lives. Although we want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is of course having a, a, an impact on all of this. These, uh, these are trends that have been long-term and we've been studying for several years. Overall, starting in 2030, it is projected that older Americans will make up 21% of the population. That's up from 15% today. By 2034, the number of adults 65 and older will outnumber those under 18. This demographic shift is not a temporary situation. It's a permanent shift towards an older population worldwide. And additionally, uh, we found that black, indigenous, and people of color, as well as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals constitute a significant and rapidly growing portion of the older adult population in the US. In 2010, People of color made up 20% of the nation's 65 plus demographic, a figure that will more than double by 2050. Advocates and aging service providers say LGBTQIA plus older adults and older adults of color face significant disparities in health and healthcare access, economic security, housing, employment, community support, and more, it's important that our creative aging work addresses these inequalities and, and that we ensure that the arts programming is accessible as, for the full span of diverse older adults and responsive to their needs. We're always adapting. So um, we're gonna have a slide here about uh, older adults and equity. There is that. Um, we wanna also address a question that often comes up about terminology with regards to creative aging part, you know, participants. Some of us talked in the aging about how we don't like to be called young. <laughs> um, we find that uh, this term, older adults specifically, as opposed to seniors or elderly, it's a wider term for all the kinds of people encompassed in this work and it's often preferable to the students themselves. But when in doubt ask, Right? Ask the participants, uh, well, how do you like to be referred to? In addition to their names, of course. Um, people have personal opinions, obviously, about the best word to describe them in their age, and it's perfectly legitimate to ask. There's also cultural differences about this. And additionally, we see people using, when they're promoting their classes or talking about their work, they're using terminology like 55 plus or 55 and better to denote who the creative aging class is targeted for. The term creative aging is also used to indicate um, this work without having to spell out a specific age, like 55 plus. So what is creative aging? We define creative aging as professionally led, 
instructional arts programs that build skills over time across, it could be any art discipline. In short, it is arts education for older adults. In the model that we've been putting forth, that we advocate, there are some components. There are at least eight sequential sessions of at least 90 minutes. And these eight sessions culminate in a public event, a storytelling event, uh, uh, an arts display. And of course, we've been working with remote models. We'll talk more about this in the time to come. Creative aging, though, it's not just a concept. It's, it's actually an emerging field. It is a booming field in which a variety of organizations like Wyoming are starting to provide meaningful opportunities for creative expression throughout visual, literary, and performing arts programming. These activities are based on scientific research and they emphasize the factors crucial for positive aging, learning skills, building social connections, and all those things that we'll get into in our curriculum building. For this training, we wanna clarify from the beginning, the particular kind of creative aging program that we'll be discussing, Lifetime Arts focuses on arts education programs for older adults. There's extraordinary work happening in creative aging, as many of you know, arts therapies. Much of this work happens in a clinical setting. There are programs that have incredible benefits to the participant, but the goals of creative aging arts education programs are different than therapeutic programs. And I've even stressed this in classes that I've had that um, while it can be therapeutic, we're not leading a therapy session. Creative arts education programs are instructional arts programs that focus on older adults as art makers and learners, as creatives. And today we're gonna to focus specifically on best practices when designing these creative arts programs for older adults, including uh, uh, the importance of incorporating intentional social engagement, which can be as, if not more important in the class than anything I'm teaching. We'll introduce the in-person model of creating a creative arts education. We're gonna talk about in-person because it's the simplest way to talk about our scaffolding models. And then uh, we will get into online and other things as the day progress. Whether we're doing in-person or virtual programs, we'll suggest arts education best practices to keep in mind to ensure that your older adult learners have high quality artistic learning and creative experience. There are some common attributes for all the creative aging arts educations classes that should be in place. And these attributes are sequential classes. So it's not just a drop in one up. There is a, a sequence to it. We're building on skills we referred to last week. It is taught by a professional teaching artist, meaning you are being paid and you have professional experience. It is registration based. Um, it's not free or fee based. We will discuss that that there's actually in this with, with you all, there is some specifics that are exactly like that. We'll note that um, the libraries, for example, they tend to be free for their participants, but they still ask them to register. There's something about committing that's very important. The, this model was in part developed from this creative, the creativity and aging study by Dr. Jean Cohen. It's really fascinating. Um, and I think we'll put a link in it, a link to it in the chat. Dr. Jean Cohen led the creativity and aging study out of George Washington University in 2006. And this study was done over three years in New York, Los Angeles and Washington DC. In each site, there was a control group of older adults, ages 65 to 103, who did their usual activities. And then there was an intervention group who participated in professionally conducted art and cultural programs. There were 50 participants in both the control and the intervention groups in all three sites. Both groups were well-matched in terms of functioning at the start of the study. And there was an expected decline in this age group. However, instead, the study produced 
these results. Those who were in the intervention group who, who had the creative arts programming used less medication, they had fewer doctor visits, they had less depression, they became more engaged and active in their lives. This was quantifiable study. Gene Cohen and others have discovered that the aging brain is far more plastic than previously believed. It's far more malleable and continues to develop. And that specifically structured learning, especially through the arts, can improve cognitive functioning and enhance the quality of life. He identified that the two most important components of creative arts education programs, no matter how it's delivered, they need to include these two main goals. They need to be about developing mastery of the art form and forming community through this art making experience. To define it even further, mastery of skills would be learning an art form in depth over time and having the opportunity to practice it repeatedly in order to become demonstrably better at it over time. Social engagement and building community between participants should be connected to the art making and the learning. And we'll talk about this as we build our curriculum. Obviously because of COVID, most elder adult programming moved to virtual platforms just like we are here. It's important to understand though, as I said earlier, the in-class model. So today we're gonna to focus on in, in-person class. And then tomorrow we'll spend more time thinking about the in-person classes to virtual and remote formats, just to clarify what we're doing. So again, the creative aging program has the following components. It is an art class. It's visual arts, performing, literary, or music. It's taught by a professional teaching artist skilled in developing sequential arts curriculum. This is a paid professional arts educator, not a volunteer. The class should be at least eight sessions, usually held once a week. Why? Because the class, again, is sequential in nature. One skill will build on another. Remember last week we did this. Now in this week we're gonna add this. We're learning the practice of skills and then it's in the doing and the practicing it grows. Each class should be a minimum of 90 minutes. Again, there might be some variations depending on remote. Right now we're talking about in person. 90 minutes to ensure there's plenty of time, at least 90 minutes to practice the skills taught. And also very important to have time to reflect, to feedback, to discuss what we're learning, to discuss what we need. And then there's also a planned culminating event at the very end of the eight weeks. That'll be a celebration of the work created for the eight weeks and it'll be shared with other community members. This has multiple reasons why this is a great idea. And we'll talk more about that as well. The goal is to have at least 10 people in each class. However, obviously the exact number of maximum students will depend on the art form. It should be determined with the teaching artist. Again, this may be different on Zoom. Registration is required for the creative aging arts classes. We have to, the students, it really is powerful. They buy in if they commit. The commitment is key. The classes can be free or fee-based, depending on the organization and their needs. In the Wyoming Libraries Initiative that we'll be discussing later, programs will be free. I mentioned that before. The classes, though, will meet at the same time in the same place every week. And the expectation and the goal is that students will come to every class. Of course, life happens, things happen, people miss a class, but you know how it is if someone misses consistently and you're referring to what you did last week and you're referring to what you did the week before and they don't know what you're talking about. It's very hard to keep the sequence going. So we encourage consistency. I always joke to my students, if they say I have to mix, miss next week, I say, well, it'll reflect in your grade, but we'll do our best to work around it. Um, again, uh, this is what the model looks like when we meet in person. Tomorrow, we'll look at the remote. Issues. Great, thanks so much, Dan. 
Um, and any questions, comments about what Dane just went through, please put it in the chat. We have some robust Q&A at the end of this whole session today. So if anything's coming up as you're listening to this, all this information, please that in the chat. Um, I am going to just walk us through another brief break. And when we're doing these stretch breaks and other kinds of breaks, we're really modeling, you know, a practice that's positive, both in person, but is especially imp important when working remotely, right? We all need a little break from the screen. So a 2020-20 break, the idea is we're going to look at an object uh, 20 feet away, ideally, um, for 20 seconds. And that when working online, we should try to take this break every 20 minutes. Um, so we just had about a 20 minute presentation. So we're gonna do this. So I'd like you to adjust so you can still hear me, but you can totally, uh, what the importance is that you're looking away from the screen. You're finding an object either out your window. Right now I have some trees. Luckily I can look at about 20 feet away. If there's not something that's fully 20 feet away that you can see maybe the furthest distance away from where you are, something you can look at. Um, so go ahead and, and stand or sit just comfortably but fully take your eyes away from the screen and take in this object that is ideally about 20 feet away. And just breathing normally, really let your eyes, let your gaze fully take in this distant object, really letting our eyes settle on this and sort of, you know, do let the lenses <laughs> look at this far distance, giving your eyes a break from the screen. Just breathing normally. And I'm gonna do us give us a little timer so we can really let our eyes focus at this far distance for 20 seconds. So just breathing. Take in this object. Blink normally, try not to stare. Let your eyes be soft, but just looking at this far distant object. All right, that was it. That was our 20 second break. Maybe not long enough, but good to just give the eyes a little break. Great. And I see some questions have come into the chat. That's great. And Nathan is collecting them all. So we'll get to those in just a bit. Um, first, just wanted to ask folks before we move into this next section, What's something that you have dreamed of studying and you would study if you had more time? If you had all the time in the world, what's something that you really would love to study? You can put those into the chat. French, Carol says, fantastic. Race car driving, Sherry, incredible. And he says piano, wonderful. So these could be art forms or they could just be you know, anything that you'd really love to study with a lot of time. Uh, Lynn is talking about teaching at the college and classes are two hours and it's never quite enough time. Understood. Other things we'd love to study if we had more time. Cooking, perfect Spanish, Wendy says, and painting with acrylics. Paul says a new language. Any particular language, Paul? You wanna put that in the chat or just any new language? Pottery. Dane, Socratic rhetoric and debate. Yeah. Then uh, you'd be unstoppable then. <laughs> um, Maria, sign language, more French, great. Archaeology, tango is on my list, personally. Ceramics, more dance, Spanish. Dulcimer, I love that, Deborah. Wonderful. Astronomy, says Deborah. Wonderful. Other Deborah, Deborah Soleil. Great. Good. Keep this coming. Um, you know, Deborah Kastner, can I call on you? Can you unmute mute yourself? Dulcimer, where does that come from? Is that related to anything you work in now or is that something totally, totally different? No, it's a, an instrument that I saw played really, really well by some people when I first moved to Laramie. And I just thought it just had an appeal of the sound and the way it was maneuvered and just would love to have one of those to tinker on when I have time. That's great. It sounds like also you're in the right place that, you know, you happened upon a place where folks are already working in this art form. so. You can might take that opportunity to learn from them. Love it. Robert says Spanish, Japanese, guitar, video sound, welding. List goes on and on. Love that. Love that. Foreign languages, Egyptology. Great. 
Lucinda says the Irish drum. Great, and Lucinda, would you mind unmuting yourself? Um, just wanted to ask you about this. Is this is this also related to your art form, or is this something totally different? Here, I'm trying. I'm asked. Are you asking me? The, yes. Yeah. You said the Irish drum. Yeah. Oh, I just love the Irish drum. We had a chance to go to Ireland once and I fell in love with that drum and I thought, oh, those guys are magical. I would love to learn how to do that. Yeah. yeah I'm a musician, but I would love to add that drumming to my, yeah, repertoire. To your repertoire. That's great. Yeah. Laura says prairie ecosystems. Important, incredible. Learn to meditate much better. Sign language. Uh, Maria says Gaelic. And Chris says cello. Wonderful. So great. Just ask that for to you to start thinking about because many of the things, many of the the reasons why you're prompted towards some of these things, whether they be maybe an extension of something you've already um, learned in your life, or maybe there's something totally new or different, or maybe there's something like, like Deborah said that happened to be, you know, an art form she hadn't thought of, but the community where she lives that became present, or um, maybe it's something you've always, you know, you might have always dreamed of and just your life took you in a different direction. These are some of the reasons why some of the prompts for older adults to engage in these kinds of programs. Maybe they have more time on their hands. Maybe they've something they've always wanted to try. Maybe they never thought about it till they saw the description of your class and they're ready now to dive deeply. Um, so things to think about, about you know, how people are coming to, um, to the work. And I love that there's some great Irish Scottish drum um, information and being exchanged in the chat. Please keep coming. So, there are some characteristics of all adult learners. Um, I think we all would call ourselves adult learners that um, include uh, include older adults that you might want to consider when you're planning your creative aging class. So these characteristics, of course, are not might not apply to all adults, but there are just some aspects to keep in mind. Um, as learners, older adults really vote with their feet, and they have very specific goals they want to accomplish from taking the class. They don't have to be there, right? This is different from the K through 12 where folks are dropped, kids are dropped off, you know, that they're gonna learn that your art form, they're gonna be in your class whether they want to or not. Um, for older adults, if, if the class doesn't have what they need, they'll, they won't leave or they just won't come back if it doesn't fit what they're looking for. So something really important to consider. Um, adults and older adults are autonomous and self-directed. You know, they're, they're gonna choose to be in class because it aligns, lines up with their interests or like we were saying before, maybe it's something they've always dreamed of studying or. Um, you know, but they're really, they're really choosing to do this for, for their own reasons. And of course, they're going to come to the class with a lifetime of experience and knowledge. Um, teaching artists should really encourage older adults to utilize their experience in the class. Um, it really has a, a potential to, to fuel their expressiveness. So it could be that they come with experience of the art form itself to the class. It could be that they come with life experience that it, in some way can be applied in the class. Um, experience, though, and time also could bring um, old narratives. So people might come into class saying, oh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an artist. Um, they could come with past experiences of an art teacher, you know, in the 12th grade that told them they couldn't draw. You know, we all kind of have these things and over time those things might get kind of crystallized. So it's an important thing for a teaching artist to, to work, might need to work with folks to develop that confidence to, to try these things um, and to consider themselves artists as we all are. Adults are really goal oriented. You know, they're, they're, there's the attitude of if not now, when? They're really serious about their learning. They have ideas about what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. So it's a really a partnership idea between you as the teaching artist and, and the adults you're working with. And also older adults are very, and adult learners in general are really practical. You know, they want information. Um, they're going to come with goals about what they, why they want, the way in which they want to use what they're learning. And they kind of want to use it immediately. They want to successfully apply what they're learning about you know, immediately. It's not all theoretical. Um, great. And Dane put um, a great link into the chat um, with some more background on this older adult learn, um, uh, ideas and just adult learning concepts. Andragogy, as we call it. Um, so there's no getting around the fact, of course, that we're all aging. While we want to assume ability, this came up before, um, the, it, from Jay, Jay shared with her about her group, you know, people assuming that all older adults have hearing problems. Of course, we want to assume ability, but these of course are issues that just do happen more as people age. And it's important to just recognize that these are all natural changes and to be prepared to address them. Um, often people aren't going to volunteer this information. 
right? And people might not come up to you and say, you know, I do have this hearing problem or I'm not gonna be able to see so well if I'm working, you know, closely or, um, so it's important that we handle these issues really proactively. We set up the space so that it's already um, accessible, um, so that it's comfortable. Uh, we're gonna, you know, design handouts so that they are, um, you know, have universal design concepts. They can really be easily read. And then also we're gonna use non-evasive assessments um, as through our teaching that are going to, that's going to give us more information on what the challenges folks might be facing or help that they might need. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Uh, so the process of, yeah, Dane. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dane. Well, it's all right. Well, just, just to piggyback on what you were saying, the natural process as we, you know, and this is the conversation, it's like having this without the ageism, but we know that it does bring a series of losses. Uh, you, you lose spouses, families move, friends move, friends pass away. And so the need to make new connections is critical. Understandably, there are concerns about money that can pervade this time as well. I didn't save enough for retirement. Isolation is a huge problem. And this has been exacerbated as we discussed before right now with COVID, it leads to the anxiety that Ashton Applewhite spoke about in her TED talk. At the same time, we would like to introduce a term that is used in the positive aging movement as opposed to retirement, we like to call it rewirement. It's a time when older adults might rethink their hobbies, their interests, and go through a very deep process of reevaluating what's important and how do I wanna spend my time? Older adulthood can be a time fraught with regret. I should have taken a left at Albuquerque. It, isolation, confusing. But it can also be a great opportunity and new adventures and, and learning await. Creative aging aims to help older adults experience aging as a positive rewiring process. As Julie talked about, see, I've had a number of, because performing arts, a whole bunch of students. A teacher told me in second grade that I can't sing and I've never sung and I want to sing. And, you know, the, we're, we're, some of what we're doing is undoing what those well-meaning teachers did back decades ago. Yeah, so important, Dane. Um, great. So just... Uh... Moving on to this idea, and Dave spoke about this a little bit earlier, safe planning. So keeping some of these older adult considerations in mind when you're designing a creative aging program is really important. So at Lifetime, we've developed an acronym for it to, to easily remember, um, which is SAFE, uh, to denote all the elements of a quality creative aging class, utilizing these ad older adults and adult learning principles we just mentioned. So this just stands for skills, assent, feedback, and engaging socially. So this info um, is gonna be available for you in a PDF form. It's already there, I think, on the portal. But just to go to, into these more specifically. So skills, skill building. This is just the idea uh, we, that we've been talking about. One skill builds to the next skill, that these programs are sequential and experiential. That, you know, it, it's really the idea of scaffolding, right? Over the arc of a workshop series, the skills are built in a logical way. Um, it's going to allow students to, you know, full, fully understand how one skill leads to the next and contribute to their own, you know, artistic skills and artistic literacy as well. Um, this is really like the foundation for the older adult students to see th themselves as artists. Assessment is the idea that you as the teaching artist are going to evaluate your students every day, every class, maybe multiple times in a class. Um, to tailor your instruction to match the needs of the learners. These are community-based classes. They're, they should be welcome and barrier-free, welcome to all. So this is gonna mean that the folks that come into your class are gonna really have a diversity of entry points and past experience. Um, so there need to be ways that you as the teaching artist can assess how each student learns and what the best approach might be for each, each specific individual learner. Um, especially tomorrow when you're going, you're actually going to experience a demo class and we will talk about ways in which teachers do this. Um, but typically it's, um, it's in warm up exercises, you know, it's, it's in feedback. It's, it, there's certain you know, moments that you can really, really allow you to hear from every student so you can assess where folks are. 
feedback is talking about the work. Um, so this is, is another kind of particular difference, I think, with with K through 12, right? This isn't necessarily as encouraged, it should be, but is not as encouraged necessarily with kids. Um, a teaching artist should really develop processes and encouraging classes where there's opportunity to talk about the work, talk about each other's work, give feedback to each other in positive, constructive ways, talk about one's own work. What was the process? You know, this is where I was trying to go with this piece. I don't know if I achieved it. Here are my questions, you know, for my audience. Um, but this idea that the goal is really that the, the student artist can, can grow in learning um, from the feedback that's given. Really important that teaching artists set up positive protocols. You know, we're saying, I, I saw, I wondered, I want to know more about, we're not saying, you know, I didn't like that you used that color, right? So we all know this as artists, but it's something that we need to model um, for our students. And Dane just put in, um, you know, Liz Lerman's critical response process, which is really widely used um, for ways to give feedback, constructive feedback to artists. And finally, this engagement piece. So Dane was speaking about this before. This is really super important with older adult learners um, and in creative aging programs. This is intentional social engagement tied to the art making itself. So, you know, folks come early and hang out and have cookies. They can hang out after and chat. That's fine and that's great social engagement, but we're talking about you as the teaching artist actually building points inside of your class for folks to socially connect, whether they work on, you know, partner projects, or in the way in which they respond to each other's work, or you know, there's lots of different ways this can look. But the idea is that this, the connecting and the, the forming of relationships really, we're really saying, are you making new friends? You know, that's really the goal. How can that be sort of sourced in the art making and art learning itself? So creative aging classes, you know, of course, are kind of modeled after the K through 12 class structure. The traditional, this is a good you know, model to use. Of course, there's gonna be flexibility, but the idea you know, here is one, one lesson is that these safe components are not only um, present over the course of a whole program, they're really all present in one class too. So you can see that you know, the warm up um, is, is maybe an opportunity you know, for social engagement for everybody to get to know each other, know each other's names. It's also a good opportunity for the teaching artist to assess where people are that day. Then there's probably going to be a skill building, you know, section. Uh, there's going to be a particular skill that's being taught that day. Um, hopefully, there's going to be some practice of that skill. There'll be some time for sharing and reflection. That's that time for that feedback. And it's also another opportunity for the teaching artist to assess, you know, how are folks doing or how was the assess for them. And then there's some kind of closing, which is another opportunity for that social engagement and also assessment. And all of this is going to be modeled tomorrow in your demo classes. So keeping in mind our older adult participants and those, those adult learning principles, you know, here's some tips for facilitation that we like to offer. Um, really important to introduce resources that might demonstrate, you know, the techniques, or the skills that you're, that you're teaching, you know, an artist's work, maybe a video, something that, you know, you might be sharing as inspiration for the work. However, it's really important that creative aging classes are, are not lecture series. You know, the majority of the class should really be spent in the practicing and the making of the artwork itself. This is gonna involve a lot of input from students. So the idea is you're gonna come with a plan. I think we all know this as teaching artists, we come with a plan and then we need to also remain flexible and be prepared to you know, adjust our plan constantly check in and assess with, with our students when it might when we might need to adjust our plan based on students needs. It might mean you, you know, people get very, very interested in one one topic and you end up changing to focus more on that topic, you know, the next class. Um, it might be, mean that there wasn't a lot of response and interest in something you were presenting and you need to change the plan for the next class. So it's just important to remain open to making these kinds of adjustments. Again, the idea is you're really much more of a partner with your students. Uh, there needs to be plenty of time to practice new skills, um, you know, and, and to talk about the process and to learn and try and fail and then try again. This is that something that's really key um, to growing that plasticity of the brain that Dane was talking about um, earlier. And that's really something that can't occur, you know, in that drop in setting. You know, it's really about engaging with art and the art making process over time. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> So over the next two sessions, we're gonna explore and discuss ways to adapt 
as Dane said, um, you know, adapt this in-person model to remote formats. Um, remote formats, of course, you know, are, are really being used during COVID, but we also believe that working remotely with older adults in arts programs is something that's going to continue because it does, can allow access uh, to folks that might not be able to attend in-person classes. So think about what are the ways that you would adapt some of these safe principles if you're working online. Some of them get a little bit more challenging. For instance, skills, you know, it can be hard to ensure that skill building is really happening in an online format. So what are some ways that you would make sure that skill building and the practice of those skills is really happening, whether you're, you know, online or you're over the phone? Assessment, particularly difficult, right? When we're in person, we can walk around the classroom. We can maybe check out, you know, how are people doing on their paintings? How is the scene, how is the improv scene, you know, scene making happening? How's that going? When we're online, say, really hard to do that assessment. So what are some ways you're going to try to build in some of these assessment moments, whether if you're working online or, or over the phone? It can be really difficult for folks to share their work online to make sure that everybody can see and view work and be able to give that feedback. So how can you facilitate feedback in a remote delivery format? And then finally, as we all know, um, forming connections, making new friends, hard to do online, though we're, we're, get, we're making lots of new friends today. So I'm feeling good about that, but harder to do online, harder to do when we're not just all in person. So what are some ways that you can really support that social engagement even if you're just calling into a Zoom or talking over the phone. And we'll go into some recommendations we have, but we just want to kind of get you thinking, how would you adapt your class to make, you know, for, for the online set or remote format so that all of these things are achieved. So here's an example. Um, John Leo Nim is a, is a Brooklyn Arts Council teaching artist. So he was one month into teaching clown and comedy skills to older adults at the Jewish Community Council of Greater Coney Island in um, Brooklyn and the senior center closed due to COVID-19. So he really had to make some quick adaptations to his in-person class, um, which really illustrates some of the things that you might wanna consider if, if perhaps you're, you're thinking about teaching remotely. So he you know, adjusted his whole curriculum to be able to work on Zoom with his students. Um, he had folks you know, continue to do physical warmups with each other and follow each other on their web cameras. And this actually was a great way that, that John could assess how his students were doing that day. How was everybody feeling? Who needed some special help? He was also really upfront that this was an experiment. He constantly collected feedback on how this was, how this was working for folks. So this was another really direct assessment of his students. And um, one assignment that he did for his class that I love to talk about was he had each person, since everyone's calling in from their homes, right? He had each person actually pick an object in their home and put it on the camera. So this was like, uh, a pack of playing cards. It was, for somebody, it was their slippers. For somebody, it was a couch. And then he had that object. He had them kind of rant as that object about their their new life during lockdown. You know, the couch was really of. You know, usually he, the couch got a break during the day when the owner went out of the house, but now the couch is being used every day. You know, so it was both a you know a chance to to build skills in comedy and clown. It also was a social engagement opportunity, and it also really served as a great assessment for John of both how how were folks building their skills but also how what how were they doing emotionally what were their how were they building social connections with each other so we also want to mention intergenerational or multi-generational programs that came up in my group um, there's already a wonderful uh, program that susan is doing um, working with older adults and preschoolers together doing music in a library which i thought was wonderful um, so, you know, multi-generational, intergenerational classes are, can be really super exciting. They're opportunities for younger and older students to, to generate artwork together. So some best practices you might want to keep in mind if you're considering, you know, teaching a, a multi-generational class, you're going to really need to think about both the younger um, students and the older adults learning needs and ensure that both these cohorts are really equitable in their sharing and that they both have opportunities to create work. Um, we kind of consider that the number one sort of purpose of intergenerational um, programs is the are deeper community connections. So that social engagement focus is really kind of number one. It's really about building connections across the generations. And it's really important that the community that you create is really a safe one for both groups. Important that there's shared learning, you know, so there's equal opportunities um, for both groups to take risks and create. 
um, there should really be shared ownership. Um, say there's like a final project that folks are working on together. It really should be equal, equally created between the two groups. Accessibility is super important um, so that it's accessible to both groups. I won't, I won't lie, intergenerational programs can be really challenging, especially for just for this reason, just purely for logistics. A big thing that happens all the time is you, you wanna do an after school program because that's good for the kids, but it needs to not be too late in the day for older adults. So you end up in a sort of like three to 5 p.m. It's sort of like the only, it, it can be really hard to make sure that those schedules mesh. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, making sure, of course, if you're working remotely, say that the accessibility, that the platform is accessible for both groups. Maybe you need some, you know, hearing assistance. Make sure that all the printouts have this universal design concept. It's the idea that, you know, they're, they're both legible by anybody. And that you might have, you know, if you're doing online, you have some tech support for the older adults and for the young folks. Um, and I think a really wonderful thing to focus on is, you know, breaking down these ageism stereotypes. You know, these, these programs, I think a real focus can be, um, you know, I, I did a lot of work with a, a company called Roots and Branches Theater um, out of New York. And the thing we always started with was what are, what are your cliches? You know, what are cliches that you've heard about older folks? What are cliches that you've heard or said about younger people? And we kind of went right into that um, pretty early on and, and being honest with each other about what are these cliches and then how do we actually disprove them in our work together? Okay, um, we're running short on time. I just wanted to go through a quick, a little bit more info on this particular initiative. The Creative Aging in Wyoming um, Libraries Initiative has the, the overarching goal of improving the lives of Wyoming's older adults. And this is a partnership with, of course, Wyoming Arts Council, the folks who were here with us today, and the Wyoming State Library. So we're, Lifetime Arts is gonna work with selected teaching artists and selected Wyoming public libraries in up to 23 counties across the state to build their capacity to develop, implement, and sustain high quality creative aging programming. Um, so this starts with this training, which is happening now, training that happened last week for the libraries. And ultimately we're looking to have libraries plan and implement up to 46 creative aging programs across the state being designed and facilitated by Wyoming teaching artists like yourselves. So the program can be any art form. Um, it's gonna be taught by professional teaching artists and Wyoming State's Arts Council uh, is going to be helping to identify and connect teaching artists to libraries. And I know um, that uh, Josh and Taylor spoke about that earlier, and they're going to speak even more about that, how that's going to work um, at the end of our day three session. Um, social engagement, intentional social engagement is going to be embedded into the workshop design, and each program is going to end with a culminating event um, that Dane was speaking about that we're going to speak about a little bit more tomorrow. Libraries can start now developing their programs, and they're going to may implement like have the programs actually um, be offered to older adults from June, 2021 to May, 2022. Libraries have the opportunity to either offer programs in person or remote. And we're gonna be going over those models even more tomorrow. So the ultimate impact is that, you know, up to 700 older adults, 55 plus, 55 and better will participate in sequential skill building workshops led by professional teaching artists and based on best practices in creative aging arts education. Each program series is gonna include a culminating event, like I said, so hopefully that will reach up to another, you know, 1500 people. Um, so libraries are gonna be free to use any teaching artist that they wish. Um, attending this training is not a prerequisite to being chose, chosen as a teaching artist. So if they have other folks in mind, they, you know, they can hire whom they wish. But attending this training is really gonna elevate you as a candidate who's really qualified and ready to lead one of these programs. Um, also Lifetime Arts and the Wyoming Arts Council is gonna act as a resource for the libraries when they're trying to identify teaching artists to help them match you know, their community needs. So we're gonna be looking at you all, this pool of, of you know, artists who are attending this training first. Um, Wyoming Arts Council has the goal of, of creating maybe some kind of directory they're going to speak more about that um, on day three. Okay, Q&A. Good, we're only one minute behind our plan. So I know some questions already came in. Um, this is our chance to get to them. Okay, Nathan, you want to throw me one? Let's see. Uh, so the first question we had, uh, 
from Lori was, uh, there's an interest in working in hospice. These folks cannot go to the library. Suggestions, or do we just do this on our own? I, I, I don't know the logistics of how it's working in Wyoming, but I, I do have friends who are doing that, going to, but, and, and in their case, they set up partnerships with um, clinics. Again, that's more in the uh, therapeutic modality, but um, that's what I know. Yeah, I think I think in this initiative, and Nathan, you correct me if I'm wrong, specifically for this initiative, I think you know, a library might choose to partner with, they might partner with any kind of organization. So, you know, they could part, say they could partner with, um, with a, a hospice to provide, you know, so that, that partnership is open. Um, that's not required, of course. So in terms of this initiative, um, that's how that would work. Outside of this initiative, um, you know, I think there's definitely opportunities to work in hospice. I think that um, I don't have any personal experience with that. I wonder about the sequential model being exactly the right model for those folks. Um, it might be the model of being able to just engage with, uh, you know, there's something called like art carts that are often in, in more medical settings, you know, where a teach an artist uh, or a therapeutic artist or an artist might just walk in and be able to offer some somebody an arts experience that happens just right there in that moment and doesn't require the sort of sequential commitment over time. I feel like a sequential commitment over time would be challenging in um, a hospice environment. Um, but I don't, I don't know enough about that specific community and connections that could be made with um, you know, folks working in hospice or, or other creative arts folks. But to us, that's really the difference. You know, it is the ability to commit over time. It just might not be possible for every population. Another thing to add to this um, is one of the silver linings of um, you know, the whole pandemic is the um, big growth in, in people's abilities to do remote programming, virtual programming. Uh, so one of the things that sort of excited us specifically about this project as well is the ability to reach people that are at a distance to a library uh, remotely. Uh, so I think that could also be considered uh, if you want to work with you know folks in hospices, what are also the um, possibilities that can be done you know virtually. Um, and as just just to reinforce as specifically uh, for this initiative, um, the programs will be uh, you know developed and mounted in libraries. Librarians do have the choice and ability to work with partners, and they may choose to work with um, you know senior service senior serving organizations, uh, things like that. Um, but uh, as Julie also said, we don't really have any real specifics about working partnering. Um, with those in hospice. Thanks, Nathan. So Gail asked, does this 90 minutes for class include prep time or could that be done at home? Um, you know, both, I think, and or. I mean, I think that, I think it's important to have some practice time during class. I think that's important because uh, one, it can, it, it's a great sort of social engagement moment where everybody is working. Even if you're working, you know, solo on your piece, everybody is in the same space together working. I think conversation can arise between people about how is the process going, how are they feeling, it can lend itself to more of a, a in-person feedback moment. Um, but I think definitely always practice at home is encouraged too. I would say the best program would have both, you know, that we're all working together in class and then we're also doing some work at home and bringing that work back to class. And if I can jump in, it depends on the art form, obviously. I'm, but in my storytelling classes, you know, when I was teaching live, I would sit back after the class and watch who's pairing up, who's walking back to their cars together, like just watching the natural self-selection of friendships form. In, in remote teaching, I'm setting that up. I'm having them meet and practice their stories with each other uh, offline on their own. I'm, I'm having them exchange phone numbers and facilitating that in chat, but I'm consciously creating practice sessions and social engagement with them without me so that they can develop that in community. Great. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Dane. Um, Greg says, is the Albany County Library a participating library? I don't know, Nathan, do you know? Uh, yes, and, but... Um... <laughs> 
so they they a representative did attend the training, uh, but essentially what the librarians are doing now is they are opting in um, on whether they want to you know pursue this, um, and then the state library um, will uh, see the pool and then basically make an allocation of of number of programs to happen. So while they did attend the training, uh, we're just not sure yet um, if they will be you know, interested in actually mounting a program. Great, a question's coming in about how is this, how are these programs similar, different to college continuing education programs? And Annie has, has mentioned this, but you know, the idea being these programs are really working in community. They should be, you know, barrier free as possible, generally free or very low cost. So I think it's gonna be a little bit more of a wide, you know, wider range of folks ideally have access than maybe would think about taking a class at a college, I think is a big difference. And also something came up and I saw Barry was, was speaking about, um, some, uh, uh, about wanting to make sure, maybe wanting to offer different, um, so several specific related topics with you, you building might, you know, being one. Yeah, Barry, might, go ahead. So, so a framed artwork, is, is more than one medium, if you know what I'm saying. It, it, sure. it, it's, got, it's got a photograph that's framed and the, and the frame might be handcrafted and it might be gilded. So how many mediums is that anyway? Sure, I mean, I don't know enough about gilding, I think to know, but I guess what, what I, sometimes what people do and we wanna make sure you're, I don't think you're doing this, but sometimes people might offer more of a potpourri. You know, these, these three weeks we're gonna focus on painting and then these three weeks we're gonna do sculpture and then these three weeks we're gonna, you know, and that's not the idea for at least all, this particular all, model. For the final project, for the presentation yeah. of a Yeah. Project. Well, and I, and I think, again, Barry, if I can poke in, again, the telling, the, the, the key is the culmination. Right. And if I'm, I as the teacher, I'm intentional about what, what I intend for that culmination to be, then I'm going to reverse engineer it through my eight weeks to, to build to that. And then I know I've been hearing again and again, I have to also understand that what, con what constitutes success and completion to me might be different for my students. It's different that, from every- That's the assessment piece, right? Right, right. So yeah, so, so the, the project that I present has to, or for the class is that it culminates in an exhibition. I'm, a, I'm all about having an exhibition. That's what <laughs> I've been from the beginning of my career. It's all about right. exhibiting the work, so. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like your, you know, it's multimedia is sort of their, you know, your, your medium. Yeah, that's great. It, it, to make sure that we're, yeah, we're working towards one goal, that we're not kind of potpourri like a lot of different things. Exactly. Um, I'm cogn cognizant of time. We're at time, Nathan. I wondered if you could answer Lucinda's question maybe in the chat. Um, but I did want to go on, um, sorry, also, Nathan, and because we think we need to take this poll, right? Yep. So we're going to take a poll tomorrow. You know, um, you are going to be in these demo classes. Um, Nathan's going to do a poll. So we have a sense of what your preference would be. We cannot guarantee we can put you in your preference because we want to make sure that the, um, the, the groups are equal. But if you're up for taking a chance on something new, please, um, you know, or if you have no preference at all, that's great for us to know too. So go ahead and do that poll. Um, tomorrow, please have a couple of sheets of blank paper and a writing utensil like a pen or paper. Um, so that you can be ready for uh, one of the classes that we're doing tomorrow. And you've got a little bit of, we've got some great resources um, in the portal and some things for you to review sort of as homework. So you'll see in the portal, there's prep for day two. There is um, a couple of PDFs to review. There's a great video um, by Aroha Philanthropies um, called Creative Aging in Person to Online. And there's um, of some blog posts as well. So we're really gonna, a lot of the resources have to do with this remote adaptation, which we're gonna go over tomorrow. Wonderful. I think we better let everybody go at this point. If any further questions, um, you know, please feel, feel free to stick around as everybody- Carol, I, sorry, just Carol real quick. I would just make a choice of what you would prefer. Um, and then you get to sort of experience it, um, you know, however you'd like to. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. I don't want to keep anybody a minute longer, but thank you for being here today. And we will uh, come back, join again tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye.